uh, it's a time for felicitation of uh, our chairperson, Dr. Renu Rajguru. Then please come and felicitation by Dr. Sampath. Thank you. Uh, next, Dr. Sampath. Next is the uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, next felicitation of Dr. Abhishek Vaidya. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's an honor and privilege always to be a part of uh, uh, two things here, being a part of AOICON 2022, uh, a big uh, stage, big uh, uh, um, uh, opportunity. And uh, of course, to also be speaking in uh, Professor Mahadevaya's session is, uh, is also indeed a privilege and an honor because uh, we have uh, learned so much from the legend himself and it's it's a good moment to uh, remember him and uh, honor his contributions uh, to the uh, uh, to the Indian uh, ecology and skull base uh, uh, forum so uh, if the slides are going through I would like to begin my lecture which is basically on skull base paragangliomas so skull based paragangliomas are um, complex lesions that arise at different points in the skull base and and there are a uh, lot of um, aspects uh, in in the treatment diagnosis treatment and management of skull base paragangliomas and i hope i'll be able to touch upon a few of uh, those topics at, uh, with the, the limited time we have uh, we are uh, going to cover a large territory so i'll be going fast as is um, a feature of most of my lectures. I rapidly run through the slides, so I request you to bear with me in this regard because it's going to be a long uh, presentation put into a very short period of time. Yes, so uh, I always begin with this slide, which um, uh, basically says, uh, emphasizes on the importance of dissections and the importance of anatomy in uh, learning surgery. So William Harvey, who was a pioneer uh, in describing the heart and its and the circulation of the part of the body, uh, very very pertinently said, "I profess to learn and to teach anatomy not from books but from dissections, not from the tenets of philosophers but from the very fabric of nature." This is uh, relevant uh, to this day as it was in 1628. So what has changed uh, in the management of skull-based paragangliomas? Uh, uh, to put this slide in a, in a nutshell, I would uh, uh, confidently say today that there is no single paragangloma, no single lesion in the skull base that cannot be uh, deemed, uh, that cannot uh, be resected and uh, hence no tumor is deemed inoperable. So the tumor of this size Massive paraganglium in the skull base is uh, uh, operable uh, and has been operated. The carotid involvement is no longer considered in, uh, operable. So I pay my tributes to Mario, who's been my guru, my friend, philosopher, and guide uh, throughout my seven years of training in Europe. And um, uh, a lot of what I am today is attributed to uh, what he has uh, uh, trained and uh, done out of me. So the anatomy of the jugular foramen is quite a complex area. You see this slide that shows the inferior view of the skull base and the lateral view of the skull base. So from lateral to medial, we have uh, the tympanic bone. We have the style of foramen through which the facial nerve comes out. Digastric uh, ridge here, uh, medial to the mastoid tip. The jugular foramen, the, the, uh, the, neur uh, the neural compartment of the jugular foramen for the 9th, 10th, and the 11th cranial nerve. You can see a small shadow of foramen here, which is for the 12th cranial nerve. The carotid gets into the petrous portion of the temporal bone through what is the petrous 
uh, the carotid canal. The same things from laterally. This is the tympanic bone. I call tympanic bone as the gateway to lateral skull base surgery because only when the tympanic bone is resected do we have access to three very, very important areas, the stylomastoid foramen, the jugular foramen, and the carotid. So resection of the tympanic bone in toto is fundamental. And uh, in your dissections, please uh, remember that uh, the tympanic bone is not what you see, you see in, uh, uh, in in autological surgeries. It's deeper. It's got a more medial attachment to the petrous part. So you have the tympanomastoid suture line. You have the tympano uh, squamous suture line, but there's also a pin tympano petrous suture line which needs to be identified. And all of this has to be resected out to make sure that you have adequate access to the styloid foramen, to the jugular foramen, and then medially in uh, to the carotid as well. So an inferior view of what we call the infratemporal fossa. Infratemporal fossa. Obviously, bony, the bony landmarks are the root of the zygoma and the, the condyle of the mandible and the ascending ramus of the mandible. Uh, laterally, medially, we have the pterygoid plates. Anteriorly, you have uh, the temporal fossa and uh, posteriorly, you have uh, the contents of uh, coming down uh, from the petrous uh, portions of uh, the temporal bone that is a parapharyngeal uh, uh, carotid and, uh, the, and the contents of the, uh, the carotid canal and the nerves that come out of the uh, uh, jugular foramen. Um, so uh, inferiorly, the infratemporal fossa communicates uh, into the lower neck as the parapharyngeal space separated by what's uh, called the medial pterygoid muscle. So this is the lateral view. Again, the pterygoids are here. You have the condyle of the mandible, the glenoid fossa, the zygomatic arch, the tymp tympanic bone, again, is so important. Release of this tympanic bone gives access to all the, that's the key. It's a small bone, but very, very, very important in um, uh, in, in the approaches to the infratemporal fossa. So uh, I'm going to quickly go through the anatomy because a lot of you who've been following me have seen a lot of these slides before and I don't want to really, uh, a lot of people complain to me saying by the time you finish the anatomy, there's no time left for your surgical cases. So today I'm going to focus only on surgical cases. I'm going to, just going to give you a quick overview of the anatomy and uh, in the jugular area, remember that there are three jugular elements. One is the jugular process, the second one is the jugular tubercle, and the third one is the jugular spine. The jugular process is a flat piece of bone between the digastric ridge, that's the master process, and the occipital condyle. You have to drill this. So when you're going, uh, uh, identifying this, uh, the sigmoid sinus jugular bulb complex, whatever is posterior to this complex, the, the sigmoid sinus jugular bulb complex, behind that, whatever you drill to reach the occipital condyle is a jugular process. So once you obviously remove the master tip, you remove the master tip in all infratemporal fossa approaches, you remove the master tip, and that uh, uh, unsure area behind the jugular sigmoid complex, which, uh, which a lot of people leave behind, uh, which is not a good idea because you don't get this, the posterior access to a tumor. And I believe that like in the head and neck, even in skull waves, you can get access to all, all parts of the tumor, whether it's a paraganglium or whether it's any other tumor. So you need to release this because the tumor, the posterior parts of the tumor is, uh, is uh, around the area of the jugular process. So th this is the jugular process intracranially uh, uh, between the mastoid processes and the occipital condyle. It's a part of the occipital bone, by the way. So this is the mastoid process. You drill the mastoid process you, and the bone uh, medial to it is a jugular uh, process going all the way up to the occipital condyle. So this is one of the processes that's very important to be identified. Uh, check this out in your anatomical dissections and uh, reiterate anatomies uh, and dissections is, is the only way forward to learn uh, 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 surgeries of the infratemporal fossa. So here you see the mastoid process, the occipital condyle, what lies in between is a jugular process. So you have the rectus muscles attached to uh, the more... Uh, uh, posterior parts of the jugular process. Uh, this is the C1, uh, transverse process of the C1. The inferior oblique muscle is attached here. The superior oblique muscle has been resected out. So basically the style master foramen is here, the master process, jugular process and the occipital condyle. So again, when you're looking at this from laterally, you see this is the jugular process. Occipital condyle is here. The jugular process is slightly at a higher plane, you know, more superior plane than the occipital condyle itself. When you're looking at it from superior to inferior, but this is where the jugular process is. The jugular vein is medial to the jugular process, jugular uh, process, occipital condyle, the vertebral artery comes here. The transverse process of C1 is here. The, uh, the low cranial nerves, which uh, lie in the medial aspect of the internal jugular vein has been uh, identified here by retracting the IJV. Now, when you uh, divide the area around uh, the occipital condyle into um, uh, three stories, uh, uh, and this is a very important uh, uh, aspect in the understanding of the anatomy of that area, you will understand 
that the jugular tubercle is something which is what I want to discuss later, uh, is in the upper story. The jugular tubercle comes in this area, so that's in the upper story. The jugular process is in the middle story and the occipital uh, condyle or the atlant occipital joint is in the, the lower story or the ground floor, ground floor, first floor, second floor. So jugular tubercle is here. I'm gonna talk about it a little later. The jugular process is between the master process and the occipital condyle that's in the middle uh, compartment and the occipital condyle and that lot into occipital joint itself is in the lower compartment. I'm sticking on to bone anatomy again because I believe that the bone is a very, very important navigation tool. I can do away with the uh, neuro navigation tool, but if I don't have bony landmarks, I'm a little concerned when I'm uh, dissecting out that case. So for me, bone is a very, very important navigation tool and uh, you follow bone, you get into all the right areas. I'm very, very comfortable, even if there are a few bony elements in my dissection uh, specimen or in my operative uh, specimen. So uh, uh, we come to what is called the jugular tubercle now. The jugular tubercle is more of an intracranial compartment. You need to go after it. it you need to drill out uh, 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 the area around uh, the jugular bulb for you to go and reach the jugular tubercle. So here you see the jugular tubercle, which forms the posterior border of the jugular foramen. Again, here, this is the jugular tubercle. But when you reach the jugular tubercle, remember that you've, you're almost uh, stepping into the gates of the foramen magnum. Again, the jugular tubercle is in a higher plane. The jugular process is in a lower plane, okay? So this is uh, the jugular tubercle is a bony projection in the me medial, uh, 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 in the lateral aspect of the rim of the foramen magnum, and it's it's far too deep. Uh, uh, and I, as I told you, you need to go after it. You need to uh, get into the groove between the dome of the jugular bulb and the internal meatus to go into the jugular foramen. And this again shows the jugular tubercle here. The jugular tubercle is here. The jugular tubercle forms the medial aspect of, of the uh, neural compartment of the jugular bulb. So here it is, here it is. So you see how uh, close it is to the foramen magnum itself. So when you're doing a lateral dissection, you have the cochlear aqueduct here, the internal trimiatus is here, jugular bulb. You drill the entire jugular process, go uh, slightly higher up. So the jugular process is in this area. So jugular tubercle is here. You've drilled out the jugular process. So first story, second story, and the third story that is the Atlanta occipital joint. So jugular tubercle is between the uh, foramen magnum and the hypoglossal canal. So let's uh, quickly go to the third, the jugular process, jugular element that is the jugular spine. Jugular spine is a simple structure which is usually destroyed in paragangliomas. It is a small bony projection from where there's a band of tissue that separates the vascular compartment of the jugular foramen in, and the neural compartment. Not very important per se because you don't go identifying the spine in most lesions. It is always destroyed because this area is expanded and you don't, uh, uh, it, it really is, is of not much relevance. But nevertheless, it comes into play whenever there is a uh, confusion between a jugular paraganglioma and let's say a vagal paraganglioma going along uh, the jugular areas, you know. So that is when you try to identify the spine. I always, you know, like to identify this spine in radiology. It's it's uh, it's, it's 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 nice to, uh, you know, in a normal radiology when you have normal scans when you're going around the jugular bulb, try to identify this uh, the spine which divides the vascular, the, the bulbar compartment from the ninth, 10th and the 11th cranial nerve, because from there on, you can then identify the lower three cranial nerves. So anyway, anatomy, 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 not uh, very important today. I want to quickly get into the uh, more clinical aspects of it. So what are paragangliomas? I'm sure those of you here already know this. They are uh, slow growing uh, benign uh, neuroendocrine tumors, but they're locally aggressive and they need to be dealt uh, quite severely. You know, we need to, uh, there's no point in going and biopsying a paraganglioma. There's no point in going and doing a partial resection. If you uh, do it, you're going to cause problems to the patient because this, these tumors uh, have a stem cell origin. So they have a differentiating structure, which means there are neural compartments, there are neural components, there are vascular components, and there is a connect connective tissue base around it. So when the tumor regrows, they grow uh, intelligently. So there is a proliferation of vascular tissue. So any form of treatment that is half-hearted, whether it's radiotherapy, whether it's surgery, whether it's embolization in the past, people used to give embolization as a primary form of treatment for paraglomas. All this is going to cause problems to the patient. These tumors are going to come back aggressively and, and, and the next time you do it or somebody else does the, the tumor, you're going to give a lot of uh, problems to that uh, 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 you know, surgeon. So now, uh, uh, classification, 
we uh, know that the skull based paragangliomas are divided primarily into temporal bone paragangliomas and neck paragangliomas temporal bone paragangliomas are further divided into tympanomastoid paragangliomas which are what we call glomus tympanicums again glomus is a misnomer we don't uh, stay with that word anymore call it tympanomastoid paragangliomas and only when surgeons start calling it by the right name the right pathological name will the uh, will the will the radiotherapist uh, uh, sorry will, will the um, uh, 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 radiologist the radiotherapist and the uh, microbiologist pathologist will also start using the right name because uh, right now i see that everybody uses the word glomus glomus tympanicum glomus jugulare which is all wrong it's, it's not the, the right nomenclature the, and then obviously we have tympanic jugular paragangliomas which is what we are going to talk about today and in the neck we have vagal paragangliomas and then carotid body tumors both of which are familiar entities to most head and neck surgeons uh, again goes to say that uh, glomus tympanicum all these are uh, chemodectomas uh, peritheliomas sympathetic nevi are all things of the past so temporal bone paragangliomas again uh, are divided into temp tympanum mastoid tympanum jugular in tympanum jugular paragangliomas we have C to D uh, classification. Uh, the C class uh, kind of coincidentally describes uh, the, uh, it, the relation of the tumor to the carotid, and the D class uh, describes uh, the, uh, the relationship vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dura. So uh, now, when the, when there's a classification like this that goes from A to D uh, in a chronological order. Uh, mm, uh, one tends to believe that class A and class B, uh, all these are progressions of the same disease. No, tympano mastoid paragangliomas clearly have a separate origin. They are middle tumors going outwards. Tympano jugular paragangliomas have a jugular origin and they get into the middle from the jugular bulb. So just because there's an A, B, C, D, A and B go into the glomus tympanicum or tympano mastoid uh, category and they are not progressively uh, tympano jugular paragangliomas. So it, it is by chance, by coincidence that it, it moves from A, B to C and D. So C and D is, uh, is a classification vis-a-vis -vis the carotid and dura. The vagal paragangliomas obviously are divided to fish one, two, and three. Shamblin uh, classification is something that all of us are familiar with. Now, sticking on to tympanic jugular paragangliomas, and my focus will be on tympanic jugular paragangliomas. What is a C1 tympanic jugular paragangloma? C1 tympanic jugular paragangloma is when the paragangloma that is arising from around the jugular bulb has made its way right up to the skull base, touching the uh, the carotid canal, not going into it, not going along it, not so much into the middle ear uh, uh, also. So that is tympano. Why are these uh, pictures not playing? The videos are not playing. Okay. Uh, I, I won't be able to show you this if it doesn't play. The button coming into view, but unfortunately. Anyway. So let's uh, skip this. So uh, remember that, that the tumor is arising from the jugular bulb and it's closely associated with the carotid. So you have the carotid canal, which is what I showed in one of the slides. So from the jugular bulb, if it's just touching the, uh, uh, the foramen, uh, the carotid uh, canal, that's C1. If it goes along the middle ear, along the vertical petrous carotid, it's C2. If it crosses the vertical petrous, goes into the horizontal petrous, it is C3. If it goes further into the more medial aspects for I mean, lacerum and cavernous sinus it is c4 as simple as that the dural compartment again uh, the c and d are not progressive a lot of people think that c uh, uh, is c and then d is an advanced form of the disease you can have a c3 with a d i have seen uh, c3 c4 with a d of course c1 c2 hardly come with the d a component which means that there's very little chance for an intradural uh, extension but i've seen smallish tumors which means c3 because we hardly get to see C1, C2 sometimes, C3 and C4 is what we generally see. C3 tumors coming with an intradural extension, C4 tumors without intradural extension is all what we see. So the dura, uh, again, C and D are not necessarily progressive. You may have a C without a D, you may have a, a small C with a, with a fairly uh, you know, a nice D component inside. The D component again is divided into di which is intradural and de which is in uh, extradural but definitely it is intracranial so anything that goes into the uh, cranium from the jugular bulb di di and de is what we need to get into and then so that's that's what i'm these are these are all uh, small movie clips which uh, unfortunately don't play and then we have what is called a weak uh, uh, classification which is 
very rare but uh, described by mario first uh, brought, brought into consideration by mario so again any tumor around the vertebral artery i've seen one case after i came down here but uh, in in the group uh, obviously there were about eight or nine cases so that's very rare you know even for a big center like theirs and you know with a big uh, series of over 400 cases uh, it, it, there, there were still just eight cases of vertebral artery involvement where the tumor goes posterior into the posterior triangle involves the vertebral artery. So uh, there again, there is an intradural and extradural uh, classification, which is something uh, that we, we don't discuss in detail you know, today. So let's get into decision making. Uh, what are the three? When a patient comes to me, when, uh, um, you know, when I consult a patient uh, of a paraganglioma, I take a piece of paper, write down about uh, the characteristics of the tumor. And when it comes to uh, the million dollar question, what are we supposed to do? I always put weight and scan on top. Okay, and I tell the patient, this is the first line of management. Because weight and scan uh, uh, means that you do serial scanning without really intervening therapeutically. Now, these tumors grow at a rate of 1.4 millimeters per year. So they're not fast growing tumors. They're aggressive. They're not fast growing tumors. So uh, if the patient is not in a hurry to do or get a surgery done, that's perfectly all right. These tumors, if they involve the cranial nerves, uh, the uh, natural compensation would have happened. So there is no need to be uh, put, a, put in a paranoid thought into the patient that this needs to be operated immediately. I always tell that you don't need to go back uh, today and think that there is going to be a surgery tomorrow. Take your time, think about all, 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 all aspects. And, and uh, uh, you know, there is, there is, we have followed up a lot of patients uh, where there's practically been no growth for a few years. So. If the patient, let's say, is young, has got his studies, you know, to be or her studies to be done, a marriage around the corner, a job around the corner, send them back, ask them to come whenever they are ready for surgery. So, um, uh, in a younger, in any age group. So this slide says age group greater than 65 years. A age group greater than 65 years, the comorbid conditions go up. So wait and scan can be offered a little more, but in any case, wait and scan of, can be offered as a first uh, line of management. Again, when there is a low cranial paralysis in the elderly, uh, one uh, can either look at wait, uh, wait and scan or look at subtotal dissection because uh, when there is a partial uh, paralysis and you, uh, you know, uh, why wait and scan? You let the compensation occur. Because when you go ahead and remove the tumor, there'll be total paralysis. And generally, elderly people don't do uh, well when it comes to vagal paralysis or glossopharyngeal paralysis, which is bound to happen in a fairly big tumor. So um, uh, you can let a total paralysis develop if there's a partial paralysis, or if there's no compensation in terms of you know, hoarseness and other things, wait for the compensation to occur fully before you go in. These patients do very well. Um, in the young patients, if there is normal uh, vocal cord function, if the vocal cord function is normal, you allow compensation. Again, uh, uh, you know, don't rush uh, towards things because it's always better to let the vocal cords compensate before you go ahead and uh, remove. In the young patients, uh, after tumor excision, if there is vocal cord paralysis, they do much better than elderly patients. But nevertheless, it's always better to let vocal cord compensation happen before you go ahead and do your work because in the immediate post-op period, there won't be that sudden uh, loss of voice for three, four months, which will eventually recover. Now, if there is insufficient venous collaterals on the opposite side, now let's say there's a paraganglioma and there's a very small jugular uh, sigmoid complex on the opposite side, better not to do anything. So subject the patient for radiotherapy, do a subtotal dissection and come out, you know, because when you remove this whole thing, you're going to remove the whole jugular sigmoid complex on one side. And if there's no collateral, then there'll be vein, uh, uh, brain edema, which uh, can be quite uh, fatal to the patient. Of course, poor general condition, comorbid conditions. So what are the results of weight and scan? One of the papers I wrote in the group form. So um, uh, when we followed up patients, uh, and there were a good number of 40, 50 patients, um, uh, in uh, three years, there was tumor stability in 92%, which means in 92% of the ca cases, there was no increase in tumor size, practically no increase in tumor size for three years. So three to five years, yeah, in that period, greater than three years, there was some amount of tumor growth. So the stability came down from 92% to 83%. And greater than five years, up to about half the number of patients. So, uh, so clearly goes to show that there's no need to hurry. Okay, when the patient is ready, let's go for surgery. 
there was no sudden spurt in tumor growth that's very important so what what happens during the interim let's uh, say we ask the patient to come after one year what will have what what will happen if there's a sudden uh, burst of a blood vessel nothing like that ever happened that's why i said these are intelligent tumors they have vascular components which proliferate nicely it's not that one vessel will bleed uh, which which can happen in vestibular schwannomas for instance because we see a lot of cystic changes cystic changes happen due to intra tumoral bleed even if this tumor is vascular we have not seen cystic areas i have not seen cystic areas within a uh, uh, a paraganglioma okay when we come to uh, radiotherapy now this is a, a rather controversial topic just like how a lot of benign tumors like vestibular schwannomas and other schwannomas have been irradiated and have been uh, subjected to irradiation uh, by in various centers by various uh, teams uh, paraganglioms too have been subjected to irradiation now i did a thorough study and this was published uh, i don't know maybe about 4 5 years back uh, and i did an analysis of all the radiotherapy studies that uh, that dealt with paraganglioms now uh, what came into just to give you a gist of uh, uh, you know that that analysis what i found was that there was lack of standardization in reporting when it came to uh, the radiotherapists themselves reporting their series so uh, when i say lack of standardizing i am talking about classifications i'm talking about tumor sizes tumor uh, radiation protocols different people uh, did different things as surgeons we are much more standardized we follow the fish classification we we have very very clear uh, protocols as to uh, what we do with all our patients now this is very important there was actually a lack of consensus among the radiotherapists on the indications and contraindications tumors irradiated were generally small in size okay these tumors could be easily removed by surgery also i mean when you talk about small in size we talk about c1 and c2 tumors and in c1 and c2 tumors in my hands i can give a total tumor resection without any cranial paralysis okay so when when uh, and and a lot of these tumors were deemed successful uh, uh, successfully stable there's a problem with my uh, slides just see if it's okay because i i'm not going to look behind and see if it's working so uh, but very importantly the contraindications for radiotherapy as defined by radiotherapists were large tumors tumors in, involving bone extensions below the skull base and neck encasement of the vessels but then again these are the key characteristics of paraganglioms so when we have a group of radiotherapists saying oh these bigger tumors you know should not be radiated they don't give good results then why do we need radiotherapy for the smaller tumors can be removed very easily you know and remember that the radiation protocols do not eradicate tumors okay it may freeze the tumor for a few years but when you go back in post radiotherapy as a surgeon it will be difficult for you to again uh, deal with these tumors because of fibrosis and all the uh, post radiotherapy changes the bigger tumors is where we need help let's say we do a subtotal resection and you know what do we do so there there is no help from radiotherapy as uh, admitted by the radiotherapists themselves uh now risk of malignant transformation when it comes to uh, radi radiation clearly there is risk of malignant transformation which is under reported in the literature whenever there is a malignant transformation we as surgeons don't go inside to take a biopsy and say that this malignancy we leave the patients alone one such case was seen at the group i have not had any cases uh, after i came down to india but this was back uh, in uh, in the center there and this was reported as well so small tumor you know let's say a c2 bar c3 flared into a big tumor within 6 months of radiation and this patient succumbed to the disease so this was we also didn't uh, you know we, uh, i don't think this was report this case report was supposed to be done we didn't get reported but how many people actually go in uh, to prove a malignancy you know we leave the patient at that you know that there is a so these are under reported so the incidence of malignant transformation which is quoted as less than 1% may not really be uh, be true now i i was involved in one of the molecular biology uh, uh, studies when i was at the group home and when we went through our uh, uh, our uh, uh, analysis of all the samples of paraganglioms that we, we had dissected out we actually found that uh, these tumors were radio resistant uh, because the head and neck paraganglioms are generated and maintained by population of paraganglioma stem cells they express this notch one receptor and the zeb1 transcription factor now notch and zeb1 are major inducers of radio resistance so we were on the uh, uh, verge 
of proving and and then i came down and these these studies are being um, carried forward back at the center on the verge of proving that radio uh, uh, paraganglioma could actually be on the other hand radio resistant so i uh, although i put it as one of the options uh, because a lot of other people would have counseled the patient uh, for radio therapy i personally uh, do not offer this as a uh treatment protocol for any of my patients so wait and scan and surgery radiotherapy is something that i discuss but i do not uh offer to any of my paraganglioma patients now um yes so we uh do all our cts we do all our mr uh it's very important to do what is called a tof sequence mr angiogram is something that uh, is uh, the mainstay that shows uh, proves to me whether the carotid is involved or not four vessel angiography is a must for all all of my uh, cases and balloon occlusion test only for my c4 c up to c3 i, I guess i can manage without a balloon occlusion test so let's skip dynamic ct and angiography mr angiography again all these are videos unfortunately none of these work so uh, i'll show it to you in one of my case cases i, I have a nice slide of a tof sequence so tof sequence time of flight sequence is a sequence which suppresses the tumor completely and gives a nice visualization of of the vascular structure uh, of the carotid and that uh, tells us whether the wall of the carotid is infiltrated or not so mr angiography has to be recommended that has to be written separately because this is a sequence that is uh, not done routinely you need to tell the uh, radi uh, the radiologist to do this particular sequence in all your cases pet scan that done in just a couple of my ca cases uh, from a theoretical point of view it's important to rule out paraganglioma in other parts of the body again these are videos which are not running here today so uh, 18f dopa is what i recommend this is something uh, that uh, uh, we uh, uh, used to do when i was uh, overseas but uh, i know here uh, aims for instance follows another protocol but 18f dopa sequences clearly locates paraganglioma uh yeah in in the primary site as well as in other parts of the body again these things don't work these are all videos let me try that bar is coming but no it just doesn't work so uh, a pet scan obviously clinches the diagnosis so if there's any uh, uh, element of doubt uh, uh, whether it's a paraganglioma or not do a f18 dopa scan and you will be sure that these are uh, yeah this is working here you see one of this is what well. yeah, this is running as well i guess i'll have to use the buttons and not the i don't have control over the ah there it's i mean ha nahi nahi ye button pe aa raha hai magar sir expand pe nahi chal raha ha okay 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 ye bhi ho raha hai na so you see this this is a a uh, pet scan which clearly uh, proves that it is a paraganglioma obviously do not biopsy any paraganglioma the reason why we depend so much on radiology is because we, we one should not biopsy a paraganglioma you will have uncontrollable bleeding okay within the surgery itself when we are operating we have a lot of bleeding i am sure you will not be prepared in an opd to uh, deal with such a blood loss so here now they are all working i don't know so uh, again one of the, uh, uh, the 18 uh, f dopa scans i don't have control unfortunately but let's go through this because this is a full body pet scan this was for a vagal paraganglioma one of my patients again not mandatory to do these scans this is a patient a wealthy patient who you know can afford it i guess it's good to document and um, uh and deal with this tumor because most of the information is provided with uh, your uh, routine radiology the only concern being that since you don't have a tissue biopsy like in any other head and neck tumor here uh, you know this is the only tool that will clinch the diagnosis so you see that there is no other lesion in any part of the body except that one there you saw that so that is the tumor that is um uh, that is coming into view with the pet scan i'm stuck let's not going forward so then we come to the next um, uh, modality that is four vessel angiography 
Now, since paraganglioma's definitely involve the carotid and however good a surgeon you are, you are dealing with one of the most important arteries in the body supplying, you know, the the brain there. So, you have to be prepared for a catastrophe. So, one of the ways you get you be prepared for a catastrophe is to do a four vessel angiography. So, four vessel means two carotids front, two vertebral arteries back. Now, let's say there is a carotid artery rupture and you'll have to close the carotid. Not happened in my hands, but can happen. One of those days, you know, it, it may happen. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, you're good or bad, but these are, uh, you know, things that can happen to anybody. So when there is a carotid blowout and you need to close the carotid, where is the contralateral blood supply coming from? Is it coming from the vertebral artery ipsilaterally? Is it coming from the carotid contralaterally? Is it coming from the uh, uh, vertebral artery uh, contralaterally. So, and then also to diagnose the feeding vessels. And I've had, uh, you know, variety of feeding, uh, feeding vessels. It's always described uh, that the post auricular artery, ascending pharyngeal, and the occipital arteries are supplying uh, these tumors. But no, I've got a lot of feeders from the meningeal arteries. I've got a, a feeders from the vertebral arteries. So, uh, uh, it's very important for you to know. And these can be rate limiting steps. I've uh, had. Uh, uh, a case, and I, I guess I'll show you one of those cases uh, of a paraganglioma, which uh, I didn't get any support from the embolizations. So it was left to me to completely remove the tumor without any bleeding. And I had extremely, you know, bad bleeding, even if I had, uh, you know, gone all across right from top, very close to the carotid, previous carotid, I had bleeding and I had to leave behind a small a strip of tumor, not because I could not take it out because it's not really, uh, you know, safety of the patient always comes first. So these are these can be pretty thick arteries, like the branches of the external carotid arteries, and the bleeding can be very, very uh, scary. You know, so it's it's important to make sure. So this is stuck. I'm not able to go forward. Completely stuck. This I'm going to show you a few cases. So I'm going to show you a classic infratemporal fossa type A, first with dissections, and then I'm going to show you one uh, surgical case. And then I'm going to show you fallopian bridge technique, which is not done commonly. Uh, very, very, very few people uh, do uh, a, a classic fallopian bridge technique. And um, uh, then I'm going to show you a nerve graft, and I'm going to show you a middle fossa approach also for, uh, for uh, paraganglioma, all clinical cases. But provided that, we are able to go through. Ready? I'll start. Okay, no? 
Okay, right. So this is a dissection. Obviously, let me go quickly. It's very important to uh, dissect posterior to the digastric up to the uh, splenius capitis muscle. Uh, retract the sternocleidomastoid splenius capitis in one flap. Expose the whole mastoid and the uh, superior oblique inferior oblique muscles. Then you go ahead, dissect the upper neck, and. and expose the carotid and the internal jugular vein and the lower cranial nerves so this is obviously not how you do a blind sac closure this is a cadaveric specimen very difficult to do a blind sac in a cadaveric specimen mastodectomy wide nice mastodectomy middle fossa dural plate sigmoid sinus uh, uh, will be identified and then subsequently closed the mastoid tip has to be completely removed canal wall down mastodectomy why am i doing a canal wall up i always prefer to do a nice canal wall up every single time just to get a little bit of practice with canal wall ups you know uh, but you can proceed with the canal wall down directly you know i get a lot of satisfaction having this kind of picture with the facial nerve i take a photo and then i bring down the canal wall it's not very important you can begin with the canal wall down uh, of course this was a, a dissection videos so i was demonstrating steps of a, a temporal bone dissection as well so this was in the national conference in turkey now i'm removing the canal wall and once you bring down the canal wall i am separating the retroparotid tissue from the tympanic bone now you see this is the tympanic bone which needs to be taken out in its entirety the base of the styloid is here this is the base of the styloid retroparotid tissue you see how i'm drilling out the tympanic bone and i would do this even in a normal um, uh, in a, in surgery as well big nice cutting burrs not so much on the facial yes here i would probably use a coarse diamond burr my use of the fine diamond uh, burr has literally stopped i don't use that anymore it's either the cutting or the coarse diamond burr and i have uh, these two uh, burrs in all sizes facial nerve has been identified and uh, this is probably one area where i use a fine diamond burr absolutely on the nerve to remove the last bit of uh, bone on the on the facial nerve and then i begin rerouting the facial nerve it's very important to reroute the facial nerve from the geniculate ganglion all the way up to the stylomastoid foramen and a little bit into the parotid tissue to get this kind of release okay so once the facial nerve is rerouted you go and drill out the lower part of the parotid bridge and then you get access to the jugular bulb now this part of bone is what i'm talking about the jugular process that needs to be drilled out you know so the jugular process needs to be drilled out the jugular bulb is already coming into view so this is the jugular process that has been drilled out you know so this piece of bone between the mastoid bone and the occipital condyle needs to be drilled out to be able to get a complete lateral view inferior view of the jugular foramen and uh, the entire lateral and, and, and now i'm getting into the carotid artery areas so that is pre carotid and uh, medial to the carotid the stitching tube is coming into view now we remove the styloid process the styloid process and its attachment the muscles of the styloid process the styloid styloid pharynges all the muscles uh, that come into view this is not how you do it you use a bipolar uh, monopolar to go along shave the uh, styloid process before you release the muscles and then that there you identify the carotid once the styloid is removed the carotid obviously comes into view not so nicely when it when there is a tumor involved 
here you see all the cranial nerves, the 11th cranial nerve is here, carotid is more medially, I'm dissecting out the other low cranial nerves, the transverse process of C1 is nicely seen here, now I'm, oh, uh, yeah, that's the internal jugular vein, so that's IJV that I'm holding up, you know, so the other cranial nerves are all uh, identified, once that is done, that is again not the way we do it. We put vascular clips. I'm going to show that in my surgical uh, cases. Vascular clips, three clips here, and then we do a surgical closure of the sigmoid sinus in the proximal end. Okay, so again, I'm going to the carotid. I guess the, the uh, sigmoid sinus has to be has been closed here. So this is where you do a surgical uh, intraluminal packing or an extraluminal packing whichever way you deem fit and you dissect the entire jugular sigmoid complex. Okay, this is how I'm, uh, you know where you do the uh, sigmoid sinus closure, the proximal part. So this is gauze space, but you use surgery cell, do an extra luminal packing between the bone and the uh, sigmoid sinus carefully. If you do this carefully, there won't be any bleeding, but if it bleeds, go inside and close the whole thing intraluminally as well. Not a problem. You can and then I prefer to do this in two places just to be sure that there is no backflow. I do it here and I do it lower down as well in this area. So in two places, you see there as well. So there won't be definitely any backflow. Now you see the beauty of this procedure. The exposure to the jugular bulb is absolutely phenomenal. So this is the, the jugular bulb. IJV has been sectioned. Now we're opening up the jugular bulb. The medial wall of the jugular bulb can be preserved, but that's only in C2s. C3 quite difficult to uh, preserve, but this is the inferior petrosal sinus. This is one point which bleeds during uh, this step. We need to close this with surgery cell. You let it bleed and then you close it with surgery cell. There'll be tumor all, all along as you remove the tumor, it bleeds. And then you separate the tumor from the carotid. That is again a critical step. So you see the carotid there, one needs to separate the tumor from the carotid. Again, this cuff of tissue, around the carotid, around the jugular bulb is again a, you know, a matter of confusion. For, for the uninitiated, this looks like tumor. A lot of times there is a fibrous band in this area because it's a skull base. From normal anatomy, you're getting into bony anatomy. So there is this fibrous cuff of tissue, which, uh, which can be, you know, you see what I'm doing. I'm cutting it with scissor. So that's not really the carotid, but the cuff of fibrous tissue around the carotid, which can be safely removed. This also would be infiltrated by tumor, but you need to develop a plane here and not be scared of that fibrous cuff, you know, and leave behind tumor. So you can drill anterior to the carotid, go all the way up into the foramen laceram, posterior to the carotid, all the way into the petrous apex and clivus, you know, so we can drill, 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 follow the tumor, no problems whatsoever, as long as you have control of the carotid in these areas. And, and, and uh, unless there's a very extensive tumor, the tumor peels out from the carotid, bleeds a little, don't be worried about uh, the uh, bleeding from paraganglioma. If you are uh, uh, paraganglioma bleeders, you know, are a given. So if you are faint hearted, don't even attempt this surgery. So when you're on the carotid, when the small portions of paraganglioma, they will bleed. They look like bleeders from the carotid. They bleed quite well, you know, and not profusely, but they, they, they are enough to scare uh, 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 the uninitiated. And, and uh, but they're definitely not bleeders from the carotid. Uh, now you see I'm doing a dissection of the vertebral artery area. This is the jugular process that I was talking to you about. You drill up to the hypoglossal canal. Now you get the hypoglossal canal medial to this is the uh, occipital condyle. I'm releasing the soft tissue here. Again, there are muscles in layers. You have the sternal uh, spinous cavities. Then you have uh, the inferior oblique. Then you have the rectus muscle. So all those muscles have to be dissected in layers. Again, um, lessons for another day we don't have. So deeper to the transverse process of C1, you have the vertebral artery. So any involvement of paraganglioma posteriorly into the suboccipital canal, I'm drilling out the, uh, 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 the lateral process of C1, and then you have complete exposure of the carotid artery. In fact, I'm going ahead and doing a carotid transposition here, uh, vertebral artery transposition, okay? So this is complete exposure of the vert vertebral artery in the trans uh, uh, at the level of the C1. So this is the arch of the C1 that has been taken out. So this is the whole vertebral artery exposed. Now, let me get into uh, cases. 34-year-old uh, male, complete paralysis of all the cranial nerves, uh, operated twice before. So you see that there is complete grade four facial paralysis. He had recently married, his wife was pregnant. So kind of a, a emotional background as well to this case. 
I do all my uh, uh, cases with neuromonitoring, of course. I monitor all the lower cranial nerves and the facial nerve and the trigeminal nerves. So, um, classic fix, fish incision, going down into the neck, mastectomy, canal wall down, labyrinth is preserved. In this case, I tried to preserve the nerve. If you can see this nerve here, I could manage to uh, separate the nerve from the tumor, but obviously, it was not a nerve that was healthy. There was no, uh, I was in a dilemma whether to sacrifice. Then I decided to sacrifice it because you go in only once. And then you, uh, I, I, uh, despite preserving the nerve, I sacrificed it and decided to do a graft. So the grafting part comes later. The tumor is completely exposed here. Okay. The tumor is exposed. And this is the carotid here, muddy carotid, tumor around the carotid, you know, dissection specimen. Completely, uh, this, there was an intradural comp uh, component. Okay, I guess I can go up and show you the pre-op pictures. Pre-op uh, video uh, scan is here. You see this big tumor, there was an intradural component. I left the intradural component uh, to a later stage as a second stage surgery. I, I took out the sural nerve, did a sural nerve anastomosis, and to end cable nerve grafting. For this case, there is a dural residual going intradural, which I left for next uh, for, for a second sitting. I never do an intra uh, dural uh, uh, extension in the same sitting as the extradural because if there's a CSF leak and there will be a CSF leak that will go down into a very large area, becomes very, very difficult to control it. So you can see the dural, uh, the intracranial uh, part of the tumor still remaining. So this is uh, the resected part. You see this line here? This is the part on the dura and going intracranial. So that was left behind. So, the, uh, and after uh, uh, a few months, so this is after the grafting. You see, after a sural nerve grafting, this is a res one of the reasons that I want to show you. A properly done sural nerve grafting gives almost a grade three. And a lot of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, people who show post-op facial nerve grafting results, you know, do not mention that in, in the same sitting, there'll be an eyelid implant done. In this case, an eyelid implant was not done. So this is pure facial nerve grafting result. It's practically a grade three. He's able to close his eyes even with the, this is after 18 months, one and a half uh, years later, he's able to close his eyes without effort and with effort definitely is able to close his eyes, but there is asymmetry. Now going to his cranial nerve functions. This is post-surgery. There is complete recovery of his, uh, uh, you know, uh, of uh, uh, his vocal cord. And this, I did a feast. So again, swallowing is practically normal, compensated uh, vocal cord movement, slight pulling of saliva on the ipsilateral side, but otherwise normal. Now I went inside second stage. You can see that the tumor is there. This is intradural work going into the second stage. The internal auditory canal is now being uh, visualized. Tumor, internal auditory canal. Internal auditory canal is visualized. Tumor here. Now the uh, intracranial contents are visualized. The tumor is being resected. The ICA loop is seen here. The facial nerve can be seen here. Now I had to preserve the facial nerve obviously because the graft had taken up so well. And this is re resecting the tumor from the internal artery meatus. This is the internal artery meatus. Resection of the tumor, you see the facial nerve here? ICA loop, tumor resected, completely resected out. Okay, the last part of the tumor being resected and then complete tumor resection intracranially. Okay, so uh, this is the final picture. You see the facial nerve is seen here, tested by neuromonitoring. Okay, and this is the uh, picture total tumor clearance intracranially. Now, this guy had a small petrous remnant Okay, which was, uh, which I thought I had removed everything, but there was a small part in the petrous apex, right in the apex of the clival region. So I went in a third time. Okay, so I used a middle force approach. And, and obviously this was after two years, there was a small growth, middle force approach, craniotomy, uh, the internal meatus area exposed. The trigeminal nerve can be seen here. I'm testing the trigeminal nerve. This is medial to the internal artery meatus, which has been drilled out. Now I'm drilling the Kawase's area. So this is the Kawase's area, which has been uh, which is being drilled out. This is the carotid being exposed. I'm now uh, medial to the carotid. 
and then I approach it from laterally. I go laterally and from middle fossa. Uh, so the zygoma has been drilled out, the root of the zygoma has been drilled out, the greater wing of spinoid has been drilled out. The tumor is coming into view, the carotid is here, looped around. So I'm pulling the carotid forward. So the small remnant here that you see is what we removed in the third stage, okay? So this is the, this is the, uh, the, uh, the petrous remnant which was finally removed. And then we put fat and close the cavity. Again, this is post-surgery results after the uh, third stage. Okay, so yeah, finish. I'm, I'm going to quickly show one more case and then we'll, we'll wind up. So this is uh, again, uh, C2 bar three in a lady perfect facial nerve function, paraganglioma. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing the first preliminary step, blind side closure has been done. Canal wall down mastectomy, the jugular, uh, uh, vein being identified, ligated, carotid being uh, dissected out and control of the carotid is absolutely important. So carotid and IJV has been controlled. The hypoglossal nerve can be seen there. The vagus also can be seen lower down. Now we do a dissection. We go ahead, do a rerouting of the nerve, okay? So the nerve has been dissected out and the nerve has been completely rerouted here. So the tumor is completely in situ. Okay, this is uh, not a fallopian. This is a classic uh, case. The styloid, again, classic in patemporal fossa. Styloid process is made bare. Look at the styloid, completely bare. Once we remove, we close the IJV and the jugulosigmoid complex has to be completely removed. The sigmoid sinus has been closed here. Obviously, these tumors bleed. Surgery so cell uh, packing uh, in all cases. We dissect, dissect, re resect the IJV and the tumor. You see, there's a free margin here, posteriorly. That is because we've drilled out the jugular process and then complete tumor resection. This is heterocarotid. Carotid is here, we are behind the carotid. Okay, so this is the carotid. This is behind the carotid, lower cranial nerves are here going intracranially here. So complete tumor resection, uh, posteriorly. So uh, obviously, rerouted nerve and uh, this. Now, uh, finally, uh, I want to show you, this is uh, rerouting results. Post-op, rerouting after six months, you see, practically normal. Uh, and this is bound to recover uh, better in a small boy. Now, fallopian bridge technique. I'm going to show you the last four slides of fallopian bridge technique. Um, now, this can be done in smaller tumors where you preserve the fallopian bridge itself. Now, this is great auricular nerve, digastric resected out, IJV identified. Carotid identified in the neck, IJV identified. I do a, a Baha for all my cases. Last two years, we've done uh, close to 40 bone anchored hearing implants simultaneously ipsilateral for all my cases. That's another discussion for another day. I'm maintaining the, I, I changed track on table. I decided to do this technique uh, pretty spontaneously. You can see the spine laxer nerve here, IJV is here. I dissected out the facial nerve going into the parotid. And then I went under the facial nerve. So this is the entire tumor, anterior, posterior, maintaining the fallopian bridge. This is something that you don't get to see uh, often. You know, I don't remember anybody doing this and showing it in conferences. So now the trick is to remove the IJV jugulosigmoid complex. But in this case, you have to be very sure the tumor is not doing much with the carotid. Okay, if, because the carotid really doesn't come nicely into view here. You have to uh, kind of work in hidden areas. So you see, I have ligated the IJV here, close the sigmoid proximally and distally. So distally closed, proximally closed, we go. And then we dissect out the tumor in its entirety. So you see, I'm working retrofacial, anterior to the facial, only for small tumor, C1, C2. Not, don't, do not use this for C3. So I'm, I'm at the uh, roof of the jugular bulb. The roof of the jugular bulb, you have to preserve the uh, labyrinth, of course, and see total tumor clearance. Okay, complete total tumor clearance, stylomastoid foramen. This is fallopian bridge technique. Uh, there are uh, other cases, obviously, vagal paragangliomas, and you know, so many things that I want to show here today. Uh, but I don't think, again, just one quick uh, this thing in all my vagal paragangliomas, I do a trans cervical transmastoid approach, which means that I do a small mastoidectomy. You see this? Quick mastoidectomy, only of the mastoid tip. 
identify the facial nerve, identify the nerve in the fallopian canal, retract the uh, stylometric foramen, and I get this beautiful exposure in the upper part of the skull base, right up to the petrous areas. So you see, I'm dissecting this tumor out completely with beautiful exposure of the posterior uh, suboccipital triangle as well. You see, I've done a lymph node dissection, a lot of lymph nodes. So the suboccipital triangle, that is the superior and the posterior part is where uh, you have restrictions when you come down up into the neck. And remember, this patient was offered a mandibulotomy, by the way, from Trichy. So I, we uh, do not, we have completely given up mandibulotomies for any paraphrenal space tumors, unless, very rarely, I've, I, I don't remember when I did the last case. Obviously, I have, uh, 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 you know, background in head and neck uh, surgery as well. My father being a, a founder member of the FHN also. It's not that we, uh, you know, uh, are, uh, you know, uh, have an aversion to mandible automies, but look at the exposure you get. You get every bit of exposure that you need without a mandible automy. I do not do any paraphrenal space tumors, uh, uh, you know, with a band. So this is the compartment which was left behind and I went uh, through the microscope and did further uh, 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 dissections. That was that part that I earlier mentioned to you about a small part with extensive vasculature from the meningeal branches and the vertebral artery. I did not want to mess around. I left about hardly about five, seven percent of the tumor behind burnt it nicely, hoping to irradiate it in, in future. So again, uh, um, the last slide obviously would be to invite all of you to Bangalore. Uh, we have set up a skull base institute. It's been a work in progress for the last two years. I have now uh, my own center and my own hearing and implant center. We obviously are doing our world skull base courses in Bangalore. So for those of you who are interested, you can apply for your fellowships uh, at my center and we'll be happy to entertain your request. Thank you so much for your patient uh, hearing and thanks for your time. Really nice, elaborative and descriptive talk by Dr. Sampath. Thank you. Next, uh, this is the management of CSF Randoria by Dr. Ramandeep Dirk. He is there online.